things. You know, we're great fans of Sazie Todd. That's why we're jumping on Zoom now to talk about her latest book, which is called Bark. I'm Anna Webb. Welcome to A Dog's Life. Sazie Todd. Welcome back to A Dog's Life. I'm so excited about chatting to you about your third amazing book that's called Bark. And we'll sit on my shelf alongside Wag and Purr. (laughs) Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for having me on the show again. I'm really excited to chat with you. Oh, well, gosh. So thank you, Sazzy, for sending... um, me you know an advanced copy uh, of Bark because I do believe that at the time of recording now tomorrow is the day of the release in the UK is that right? Um, I believe it's actually today. Oh is it? It's It's caught up with us yes so it's just out in the UK it was released in North America first and the UK had to wait a few weeks but now it will be out in the UK too. Fantastic, because certainly um, there's a lot of dog owners um, here that will will really benefit from Bark. Because, you know, Bark, well, you describe Bark, Zazie, and why you've added this to your collection. Thank you. I wrote Bark because I wanted to give hope to people who are struggling with a dog who is fearful or anxious or reactive, because that's really, really hard for the person. And it's also really hard for the dog to keep being put in situations where they're not comfortable. And so Bark gives people advice on what to do and how to help your dog. And because the training, it can be a bit technical. So I try to break that down and make it really easy for people to understand what they need to do to keep their dog feeling safe and to help them learn to like the things that they're afraid of and so it's full of practical tips and it's also got some tips to help the person too because this is such a difficult situation for many many people and it can feel very hard to to get through and to deal with this kind of issue. Yes I I, I mean this is so so brilliant particularly I think at the moment Um, I mean in the book you do actually use um, a statistic which is quite shocking which is that 75 percent of all dogs do experience some anxiety and and are fearful I mean that's a a lot of dogs I mean would you say Zazie you feel that's so high because of some of the pandemic fallout that figure is actually more from pre-pandemic so I mean I was quite shocked when I read that that comes from a very large study that found that almost 75 percent of dogs have some kind of fear or anxiety and the most common one which I'm sure many people's dogs will have this is fear of loud noises which they put it depends on the study so it's up to about half of dogs have some kind of fear of loud noises in such as fireworks or cars backfiring or something like that and that's the most common but other kinds of fears that are also very common include being afraid of new people afraid of dogs they haven't met before and afraid of new situations and for many dogs that might include going to the vet as well so there is a sense that the pandemic has made things worse because for people who went out to get a dog during the pandemic, there were times when if they had a puppy, they couldn't go to puppy class or they couldn't socialize their puppy and do a good job of that. So that does seem to have made things worse. But unfortunately, it just seems to apply to a lot of dogs. Yeah. Well, interesting. The Royal Vet College over here, combined with Battersea, revealed some figures um, in January this year, which concur really on this 75%. But this study was just done on pandemic puppies. You know, they were studied from the beginning of the pandemic to, you know, January this year. And the fact that sadly owners hadn't really made any progress with their dogs in in four years so quite quite sad really for for dogs which is why this book is I think so useful you know very useful because it's split into two sections the book isn't it Sazzy? Yes there's a section at the beginning which is general information that will help anyone with any kind of fearful dog with their dog's fears and anxieties and it explains things like the idea of giving your dog a safe space which they can come and go from 
as they wish because that can help to give them more control over the environment and it can help to bring those stress levels down and it explains that training that we do and it also includes a section on medical issues because these days especially thanks to some work from the University of Lincoln in the UK we've got a much better understanding of the fact that sometimes pain and other medical issues can contribute to fears and anxieties and then later on the book has different chapters on things like social fears so that's fears of strangers and fears of dogs they don't know on resource guarding on separation related issues and other kinds of fears and anxieties so this helps people to apply the information from the beginning to the specific issues that their dogs has got and it's worth reading full because it just gives lots and lots of examples of how to do it and I think people find it very helpful to see examples of how people have dealt with dogs like theirs or what kinds of things good dog trainers recommend for dogs like theirs so hopefully people will find a lot of useful information in there well yes no it was absolutely brilliant rereading everything myself and I I love the way um you're very humble and talk about your own dog through this and as a rescue and how you know it's quite hard um to sometimes for people I think to see when their dog might be fearful or or anxious and and just going back a tiny bit what I really loved is how you define the difference between fear and anxiety because fear fear response is something that's innate in us really and we kind of ought to have it otherwise you know there might be a situation where we might die or the dog might get run over or you know there's something you know dangerous that you know the dog should be a little bit afraid of and run away from to save their lives arguably that's right so fear is actually a really important thing that we all have we have as well as do- our dogs have and it can help to keep us safe so fear is a response to something that is dangerous and it can make us run away or freeze or whatever happens to be the correct response to keep us safe in that situation whereas anxiety can be more of a long lasting thing and it can be something where the dog or or it applies to a person too because a lot of the research on this it's on people or it's on rats and mice and there's a bit on dogs but not so much so anxiety can be a longer lasting thing and the dog might be on alert a lot of the time and that's really quite bad for them in the long term because that stress response it's not good for their health it's not good for them uh, psychologically speaking either really and The thing is, we as dog guardians don't necessarily have to know the difference between them. We just need to be able to describe to our dog trainer and to our vet what kind of things we see in our dog. But vets especially might be thinking about which it is. And there are some anxiety disorders which only vets can diagnose. And I'm not a vet, but your vet might recognize one in your dog and and therefore want to recommend medication for it. So it's really helpful to know, but it, it is important to remember that that we have fears and anxieties too. And I think often we say we mustn't anthropomorphize, but it can help us to feel empathy for our dogs sometimes and think that even though we don't understand why they're afraid of whatever they're afraid of, we can kind of try and put ourselves in their, in their paws basically and mm. think about what it must feel like for them and that can help us to help them feel safe. Absolutely. And you talk about you know, how you can do that by recognising certain body language, certain uh, postures, ear carriage, eye carriage, you know, dogs looking away from you, um, lip licking, tail carriage, all of these little clues that maybe for, you know, a first time dog owner may not be obvious. I think they're not obvious to people at all. And it's something that comes with experience. So someone who's a dog trainer who has a lot of experience working with dogs, it ends up becoming second nature. And then you can't unsee it once you know it. But for someone who is new to dogs, it is a learning experience to learn to recognize these different signs, such as the tail being tucked, the posture being low, the ears being back. Yawning is something people often think, oh, the dog is tired, but actually it can be a sign of stress. Lip licking is another one. If there is not a cookie coming in, then most likely that is a sign of stress as well. And sometimes there can be what we call displacement behaviors. So perhaps the dog will be sniffing at something and it's not really an interesting smell. It's that they're they're kind of trying to distract themselves or show that they're not paying attention to something stressful that's happening over there. So it's important to take the whole dog's body 
body language into account and also to think about the context because if you know this is a context in which some dogs are scared well maybe your dog is scared too and that's something worth thinking about so if there was just a loud noise or if you're at the vet for example maybe your dog actually is scared and you can look and practice learning some of that body language and there are some photos in the book to help with that as well and some drawings and I think it really makes a difference because when you know that they're scared then you can step in and do something about it if you're not recognizing those signs then unfortunately you can be putting your dog in situations where they are scared and then things are just likely to get worse Yes. And, you know, sort of digging your, digging your head, putting your head in the sand and thinking, oh, he'll grow out of it. You know, like you might say, I don't know, um, with, with a human, it's a phase they're going through, you know, that maybe isn't helpful either. And it's understandable that people might think that and that they might want to wait and see what's going to happen. But usually they don't get better, unfortunately. Usually what happens is that they do something called sensitize, which basically means that they get worse. If they keep on being put in that situation where they're afraid, their fear is just going to get worse. And in a way, we can think of it as not putting dogs in, not throwing them in at the deep end. Um, because it's not good for them and it just risks making things much worse. If you know that your dog is afraid of something, it's really, really important to keep them away from that thing or protect them from that as much as you possibly can while you work on your training. That will help to keep them feeling safe and also it will give you some kind of space in which you can work on training and doing something about it. Yeah, very, very good. No, it's absolutely true. And talking about all of this, okay, so how much in your view, Zazzy, is is it down to, you know, training methods? So we're going to talk about those, obviously, you know, I'm very much into positive reinforcement. And, and this is a big you know, theme, if you like, through the book, reiterating much of what was in WAG, really, about the benefits of not using aversive training methods, like, for example, you know, a choke chain or shock collars or those squirt collars to help stop your dog barking, which, you know, often really don't work, right? The thing is that aversive methods like that often make things worse. And especially if your dog is fearful or anxious, you don't want to be doing things that might make them worse. So we have quite a lot of research now on these methods, like the examples you gave. So like the citronella collars or like shock collars or choke chains or even just yelling at your dog or tugging on the dog's leash which people sometimes euphemistically call a leash correction, a lead correction. Um, those kinds of methods, unfortunately, have risks for dogs' welfare. And those risks include fear, anxiety, stress. They may make the dog more aggressive. They can damage the relationship between you and your dog, which I think is especially sad because we get dogs because we want to have a good relationship with them. And it's very saddening to think that, some people are using methods that will damage that relationship and make it worse. So there's a whole range of different kind of things that can happen as fallout from using those methods. And it's really important for people to know that they should stick to using reward-based methods, by which we mean most of the time you're going to be using positive reinforcement. It works really, really well. There is a misconception that sometimes it doesn't, but it really does. It works brilliantly well. Some of the research even suggests that it works better than aversive methods. And the probable reason for that is that it works to motivate your dog. And if you just think about the way your dog is motivated to do something when you have a treat in your hand, um, that will help you to understand why reward-based methods might actually work a bit better. So I think most people do use reward-based methods most of the time. It's in those instances where the dog does something that they don't like, that they are perhaps more likely to fall into the trap of using an aversive method. And it's important not to. If someone is using aversive methods, they need to stop and they need to learn how to deal with that situation using reward-based methods instead, because it's much, much better for your dog. Well, yes. And it, you just have to think about, I think, on a human level, how you respond, one responds to situations, be it in the office or in any situation socially. We like when people are nice to us. 
<laughs> and uh, welcoming and positive and perhaps give us, you know, uh, praise and a little pat on the back, you know, for something that you've done, you're more likely to kind of repeat it again or or want to do that again for you are you with me it's like um it's very simple it works in the human sphere absolutely that's a really good way to look at it and the other way to look at it for the human sphere is to look at it in terms of children and how we teach children because there is a huge ton of research on how people teach children which shows that there are actually very damaging effects of the use of corporal punishment or hitting children for example and so we know for children it's not right and the amount of research on dogs is smaller, but it all points in the same direction too, that it's not a good idea to use aversive methods with dogs and you need to stick to positive reinforcement, which very often means using treats to train your dog. And there's a whole lot you can do about choosing the right kind of treat for the training situation. And it's also worth knowing that this is a skill. So if anyone is struggling with this, then it's a good idea to get a dog trainer to help. Yes, no, 100%. Because a lot of it is, um, I think about timing, you know, I'm very much and that's where, of course, it, once you know and feel confident with with a clicker to capture moments, literally with with a click, um, it's kind of so smooth compared to saying something, sometimes you're slow, whereas just going in there and marking it really eloquently in a way that the dog totally gets because it's it it resonates with the dog of course if your dog is super sound sensitive then a clicker may not be the right option to use yes and if you've got a super sound sensitive dog then some clickers are quieter than others or you could use the click of a ballpoint pen or you could just say yes if you wanted to mark something or have some other word that you choose to to mark a behavior and the important thing is that that is then always followed by a treat so that the dog knows that when they hear this noise they've done the right thing and they're going to get a treat and then they're much more likely to do that thing again in future yeah so tell me why is, why is classical conditioning kind of Pavlov's theory, kind of always tapping you on the shoulder, Zazzy? The thing about Pavlov is that it is to do with emotional learning and those emotional responses. So we just talked about people liking it when, you know, we give them a pat on the back or something. There is this positive feeling that's associated with it. And the same with the dog. If you are giving your dog nice food rewards for something, then along with that comes a nice emotional response. They're happy about it. They like it. So they have the positive emotional response to the food itself. And then also they'll be having a positive emotional response to the person who's giving them the food. So that's you. So this is why it can help to build a good relationship with your dog and then also hopefully if you're using it as counter conditioning they'll be learning that this is associated with something that they used to find scary and now when that that scary thing happens they get a wonderful treat and they will be learning over time that actually it's not scary because it predicts all these wonderful treats like lots of nice cheese or steak or something like that so we always say Pavlov is on your shoulder because it's a good way of capturing the fact that it's not just about the dog's behavior even when all you're doing is trying to teach the dog a specific behavior there are these other things happening and on on the one hand if you're using positive reinforcement there are lots of positive things creating positive emotional responses but if you were using aversive methods like a choke chain then it would be creating negative emotional responses instead yes no amazing I love that well you know classical conditioning I think the key in the book as well something that you know obviously resonates throughout is that Classical conditioning can never be too slow. I think a lot of people try to rush things or they may think, gosh, this is going really well, um, and then take too much of a jump forwards in, in the process and then find things have gone a bit wobbly again and may have to take a couple of steps backwards, which when I'm working with dogs and, and their people, I always say, never worry about that. If you found, you know, you've, you've gone a bit too far there's no harm or shame or anything um in going back again and then going over from where you were to where you want to go forward again would you agree on that <laughs> I love the way that you put that because I think people can sometimes feel a bit upset if they have to go back a bit in their plan, but sometimes it's absolutely essential. And the thing about classical conditioning is you have to work at the dog's pace 
And that can be very, very slow in the beginning. And there's some examples in the book. So it can feel quite hard for the person and you want to go faster. And it's so easy to accidentally jump too far forward and then you do have to go back. So it's really important when you're using classical conditioning with your dog to try and make sure that they are feeling safe all of the time and that you're not putting them in situations where accidentally you are scaring them. But if you do accidentally do that in the moment, still offer them that wonderful treat, get them out of there first or get them into a, an easier situation first and then offer them that treat. Even if they're too scared to take it, still make the offer so that they know that that scary thing is still associated with treats and then just go back in your plan start again much much further back and go much more slowly and it's such a common mistake that you're absolutely right no one should feel bad for doing it because everyone does it at some point I've done it at some point um, and you just have to say okay this is a learning experience for all of us for the human as well and go back and then just go very very slowly um, and just really try hard to keep the dog feeling safe and this is where recognizing that body language really comes in because it helps you to do that yes absolutely and you know counter conditioning is something that do you think people get confused with that um i mean it's quite confusing i think some you know if you're talking to people it's best always to simplify what you're trying to explain to do, I think, rather than loading people with the psychological phrases. But in your, your book, you've really gone for it with it all, which I love because it, it it is a good way, you know, you have to explain it. But counter conditioning, which is part of classical conditioning, is when you're, you've identified the scary thing, say a new cat that's moved into your home, <laughs> and, you know, you're training your miniature bull terrier to like the new furry person <laughs> that's moved in unexpectedly. And so, you know, gosh, I've had fun with this over the last year. <laughs> it has <laughs> taken a year. But now Prudence and Baggy, the new uh, feral stray tomcat that moved in after, sadly, Gremlin, my, my cat, passed away. Most randomly, he this cat turned up on my doorstep so bizarre really but that we won't talk about cats now we might have to do another episode though about cats soon though Zazie you know but it it did take a um exactly that we're in the room now we're out of the room and then we're in the room and and in my head I'd count to hopefully five sometimes we didn't quite get to five we got to three and a half and then Prue's body language told me it's okay it's time now to exit and then the time when she's in there of course lots of positive rewards and then suddenly though you know these because obviously this is in my home the odd moment would happen when I suddenly thought crumbs that was good Baggy just walked past Prudence in the hall and Prudent mind she just stood there which was great and then these little moments kind of happened accidentally and and that's great about it because sometimes those accidents that you're not expecting catch you off guard perhaps catch you know the dog off guard and there's a there's a great positive response <laughs> It is. And I, I love that description of it. And I think this cat knew what he was doing when he turned up at your place, even though he's caused you a lot of work. Um, he picked the right place to go. But I mean, it does take a long time. So that's one thing that's worth mentioning. So you've been working on this for a year, I think. And it's I think it's helpful for people to know that this can take a long time and that you just have to keep on working it through that and through that time period. And things will just gradually get better and you have to just go at the dog's pace so you can't predict in advance how long this is going to take but those moments when you have those little accidents and actually it's okay that's lovely because it can feel like everything is taking forever sometimes <laughs> and it's good when you have those moments and you can actually look back and see how far you've come and I think that's one of the things that can help people when they're working through this is just to keep track of progress because otherwise Sometimes people think they've made no progress and actually they've made huge progress really. And maybe it's a cat, maybe it's other dogs. And all of a sudden they, they've narrowed this distance where the dog can be and they still feel safe. And that's massive. And it's massive for that dog, especially, but sometimes the person doesn't notice. Yes, it's a bit like, you know, you don't notice, for example, if your dog's maybe gained a, a couple of pounds because you'll kind of see them every day, you know, so you, you don't 
really recognize your achievements until those surprise moments happen and you think gosh this must have been working what would you say you know a lot of puppies at the moment or a lot of dogs at the moment have sadly been bred in not the best environments like puppy mills and and the like as we call them puppy farms how much do you think anxiety noise sensitivity is inherited to some extent it is, but it's important to know that there's a range of factors that go into creating fears and anxieties. So it's it's not just one cause, there are multiple causes. And I think that's especially helpful to know because sometimes even when someone has done everything right, they can still end up with a fearful or anxious dog. But for the dogs from puppy farms, it's really important to try very hard not to get one of those kinds of puppies and to go to a responsible breeder if you can. And some of the things to look out for would be making sure that you see the puppy with the mom and using a puppy contract like the one from the RSPCA that will help you to make a good choice of getting a puppy from a good source so genetics is part of it and if people can see the mom and ideally also the dad of the pups and see that they're friendly and confident um, that can help because that if they actually were seeming very fearful anxious or aggressive that might put you off getting a puppy from that particular breeder but it's not just genetics, it's also epigenetics, so things that happen to do with stress while the pups are it's still in the womb, for example. Early life experiences, so those early experiences when they're still in the nest with the mom. And then the biggest thing that we can control is the sensitive period for socialization, which is from three until about 12 to 14 weeks. So first of all, you have to ask the breeder what they're doing to, sensit to socialize the puppies during that sensitive period before they come to you, because they should be getting started on that. And then when they come to you, it's up to you to make sure that you are socializing the puppy, giving them a wide range of positive experiences in which they have a choice. So they have opportunities to meet people. They're not forced to meet people. They have opportunities to meet other puppies, ideally in a puppy class. So a good puppy class is a really important part of socialization. But then that's still not the full story because it's also possible that dogs can just have a bad experience at some point and then that can make them afraid in future. And then also medical issues and pain can contribute. So for example, a fear of loud noises that suddenly develops in an adult dog that's something that people at the University of Lincoln have associated with pain um, so if you have a sudden behavior change in your dog it's always important to see your veterinarian and get get them checked out yes the pain um, study it's something you know I was aware of because um, prudence it's quite a great case study, actually, for absolutely everything, I've got to say. Heading nine and a half now, she is now, and gosh, we've been through so much. And, and in a way, it's so rewarding, because something you do touch on in the book as well is so perhaps the puppy, you know, that, that you brought into your life, you know, doesn't perhaps live up to the dog that you had before. That's quite a common issue because no dog could live up to that dog before. Do you know what I mean, Sazzy? So, and then you, you know, because that's a high benchmark to make, but there's um, so many puppies, particularly if they're bull terriers, are um, extremely clumsy. And, you know, as a breed, I think they're, their strength and their weakness is thinking that they are invincible. So there's all these stories of bull terriers eating things, bull terriers jumping out of windows. I mean, you know, things you really probably would never hopefully see any other breed of dog do. So Prue, you know, she's got a slipping kneecap. And I do believe that has exacerbated her noise sensitivity. But I did see it in her mother. And I turned a blind eye to it way back. There was definitely anxiety, which the breeder doesn't, you know, admits. So, yeah, so I can see how it is a combination of, you know, being congenital and perhaps exacerbated by, you know, an injury and other things, other, other factors. So it is interesting, particularly as we're heading into fireworks, right, and Halloween right at this moment in time. I mean, what would you say then to people at this time of year, it is kind of like fireworks season is about to start in two weeks, if their dog is still very fearful and um, anxious of noises, what would your tips be in a very short time frame now ahead to make a difference for this season? 
Yeah, so there isn't much time in which to actually teach your dog that sounds are okay after all. That's something you could work on for next year, perhaps, and that should be kind of on your radar to start thinking of that. But in the short term, the best thing is to see your veterinarian and see if they would recommend medications or not, because quite often they will do and they they have medications that can help a dog through in the short term. I'm not a vet, so you'd have to speak to your vet and see what they recommend. But that would be the first thing that I'd do. And then the other thing would be to think very carefully about what you're going to do with your dog on those nights when there are likely to be fireworks, which unfortunately is not just one night. It's kind of several nights either side as well. So that would include making sure that you've toileted your dog before there are likely to be any loud bangs. Um, making sure that they are safely in the house and not in your garden. Um, so they're not going to be able to escape if they get s suddenly terrified by a loud noise. They can't just run off and escape. And also to think about making sure that you've closed your curtains or blinds so they're not seeing any loud flashes. And then think about the kinds of sounds that might help to perhaps drown out some of that sound as well. And also see if you can be with them so that they're not on their own through this terrifying experience. And that might not be possible, but if you are with them, some dogs will come to you for comfort. And it's important to know that it's okay to comfort your dog. Um, in fact, you should be comforting your dog. So there used to be an old myth about that that we can completely ignore now. You should be comforting your dog if they want comfort. And the other thing that you can do is make sure that you have lots of really amazing treats, pieces of steak, pieces of cheese, maybe a sardine or something like that, so that you can start saying, okay, there's a bang, I'm going to give you a treat and make sure that you do that. Because even that, what we call ad hoc counter conditioning, it's not a training setup, but it still can really help to make a difference to dog's fear of loud noises. And then you can make a plan in the longer term to do something to make next year a bit better to do lots of training over the whole of the next year to make next year much easier for your dog. Absolutely. And um, that's great, great advice. What do you reckon to, you know, using sounds you know you can download various sound scary compilations if you like that include fireworks thunderstorms is is another one we've, we've had quite a few in the UK which is a bit unusual actually of late and thunderstorms are a bit like fireworks aren't they even a bit worse because I think it builds in the atmosphere the storm and of course dogs can pick up these kinds of frequencies so it's also about understanding how dogs hear things isn't it Sassy like you said earlier about looking at situations through your dog's eyes or or through their paws how are, how are they feeling and of course a dog's hear, a sense of hearing is completely different to us their hearing is different than ours there are lots of things they can sense some things that we can't pick up on or also we just might not be paying attention to because we know that they don't mean anything but if your dog doesn't know then they'll hear it and they'll think oh what was that and they might be a bit scared so it's really important to see things from your dog's perspective and do whatever you can to help your dog to feel safe and so these recordings that you can get, if if people want to use recordings, they can work well, but for things like thunder, they're not completely capturing it because there's the sound of the thunder. But as you say, in a storm, there are also all these other changes and changes in the atmosphere. And sometimes even the atmosphere can feel quite electric. So we can't desensitize our dog to that in advance because we can't control any of that. But you can still work on the sounds. And the, th the important thing is to play them really, really quiet, which is much, much quieter than you think is going to be OK, because you need to play them at a level where your dog is completely happy with it. So that's super, super quiet. And then even though your dog is completely happy with it, because this is a training setup, you're going to make sure that each of those sounds, so each of those bangs of a firework that's a super, super low level, you're going to follow it by a nice piece of chicken or something. And then over time, you will be able to slightly increase the sound level and then slightly increase it again, all the while making sure your dog is happy. And basically, that's how you would do what we call desensitization and counter conditioning to noises. But it's important, though, to do what you can to stop your dog from experiencing noises outside of that, because your training will work much better if you can help them be safe throughout. And the other thing is we cannot control what happens in real life. So unfortunately, sometimes there will be times when they hear a loud bang and it's not part of our training setup and it's louder than we would have liked and they're a bit scared. 
we still have to give them a treat. So you have to have those treats to hand, whatever you're doing, so that if this just happens to happen in real life, you can still give them that piece of steak or piece of cheese or whatever it is that your dog really loves. Yes, and it's true. You know, this is something, a good point here. You know, you're out and about and you just don't know when something is going to happen. A bit like the cat in my hallway, you know. Um, So in a way, it's like ad hoc great training, you know, and obviously I rewarded Prudence hugely for that moment. It's a tricky one, um, all of these noises for a lot of dogs, but maybe to use these sounds when your dog's eating. Is that an idea? Because then that, you know, is a... A moment you have to do every day or twice a day or if you've got a puppy might be three or four times a day so it's an opportunity a window to think great let's put some sounds scary sounds that are scary on for the dog while they're eating so you can factor it in quite regularly into your routine you could do if you want to do it that way the thing to remember is that you want the sound to start before you start getting the food ready because one thing you need to pay attention to is that the thing that's considered scary predicts the wonderful treats so that's one thing that is kind of a technical thing and I've tried in the book to really break it down and make it easy to understand because that's one of the things that people need to get right the the thing that's considered scary has to happen and then when the dogs notice that, it's followed by the ultimate snacks. So, yes, you could have a recording playing. So you could start the recording, then quickly rush and get their food ready and give them their meal. But it would also work better if you made it a really nice meal. So the other part of this is that it helps if the dog is getting a wonderful surprise. So I think for a lot of dogs, they really love their meals. But at the same time, if someone's just feeding their dog kibble, that's not going to work as well as if it was kibble with a whole load of wonderful stuff thrown in so that the dog feels like you're throwing a nice party for them. <laughs> so yes. that's the that's the other thing to bear in mind. So the technical aspects of this, they actually make a big, big difference to how well it works and I think it's a common mistake for people to make especially you might see this with a reactive dog if someone's using counter conditioning with a reactive dog and you see a dog in the distance so you get food out to give the dog but your dog hasn't spotted that other dog yet what will happen over time is that they will see you get the food and they'll be looking around like okay where's the scary thing where's the other dog and then you know that you've got your order order of events wrong and that's something that everyone does at some point so you need to make sure the thing that's considered scary is followed by very quickly the ultimate snacks and that's the best way I think to think about it and you're trying to give your dog this wonderful surprise so that it's not a scary thing it's something that predicts this wonderful wonderful party. Yes, and to be less worried about maybe your pocket having ingrained cheese in it over time, you know, that I, f- I find opening a packet, you know, um, it's like, no, 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 please, can you just put the treats into your pocket? By the time you've opened the packet, got the treat out, you've, you've A, lost the, the moment to capture, um, and B, it's also clumsy and it's fiddly you know and sometimes you can get a bit annoyed at the packet because it doesn't open very easily so for me personally I just think you have your dog walking or your training jacket which uh, you know it doesn't matter it's not your posh jacket so it doesn't matter if you've got sort of bits of um all sorts of things in there you know from a bit of air dried liver different varieties of things some cheese maybe a little bit of ham maybe a bit of chicken so they are able just quickly to capture the right moment absolutely that's really good advice and it really pays to think about this in advance so that you know where you're going to store those treats and as you say it's not your posh jacket even so there are bound to be times like has happened to me when you walk into the coffee shop and you reach into your pocket to get some money out to pay and out come all these really yeah. stinky dog treats oh, and you so think oh it. that's why my jacket smells <laughs> but it's all part of helping your dog to be happy so it's worth it <laughs> yeah yeah I know. Well, finally, in terms of, you know, building confidence in, you know, an an anxious pooch, how high would you rate trick training, Zazzy? I think trick training is a really fun thing to do with an anxious dog because it is often the case that we can't take our anxious dogs out and about to get as a 
as much enrichment as we normally would like to do. If they're too scared on walks, then we can't walk them very far or we have to only walk them at quiet times of day. And tricks training is something that you can do at home where they feel safe. It gives them the chance to earn lots of wonderful treats from you. So it also is going to be helping to build that relationship with you. And then it becomes something that you can use to help the dog in some situations like for example you're at the vet if you've taught them to do a nose touch to your hand you can have them do that just to keep them occupied in the waiting room or to help move them from one place to another so it can end up being really helpful even though it's something that you do just for fun and the fact that you're doing it just for fun I think is helpful for the dog's guardian too because there's no pressure to get it right it doesn't matter if the dog messes up or makes slow progress you're just trying to do it to have fun to Together. So it's really good for both parties, I think, but it is especially good for anxious dogs. And there's a whole section in the book about tricks training and some of the things that you can teach your dog and some of the ways in which you can use them as well. So there's a lovely example of Ruckus, who is a dog who belonged to Erica Beckwith of A Matter of Manners Dog Training. She does a lot of tricks training. She did a ton of tricks training with Ruckus. And then when she had to go to the vet with Ruckus, because Ruckus was quite fearful at the vet, she used that tricks training to help Ruckus to feel more comfortable. And there's a lovely picture of, of Ruckus doing a trick at the vet. So it's it's more useful than you think, even though it's something that you do just for fun. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, uh, honestly, I think, you know, I call it touch when the nose touches the hand. I mean, it, it's wonderful. It's uh, the beginning of target training as well. And then you can extend that to all sorts of fun doggy dancing maneuvers and even apply it when, you know, you might be doing a dog sport, which is something else, you know, you look at in the book, you know, having hobbies, I suppose, is one way of looking at it. So, your border collie's hobby might be running an agility course you know another dog's hobby might be learning to find the British truffle which is something I've, I did with Prudence because she's a very very nose driven dog like many dogs are I mean all dogs are driven by their nose but some are I think more driven than others so you know there's all these projects hobbies um, you know planning your life around your dog. I love that way of putting it I think Prudence is amazing has an incredible nose and yes for any dog they like to have things to do and sometimes with a fearful or anxious dog it can be a challenge to find things that they can do but it's so important that they do have these things because having positive experiences is such an important part of good animal welfare having the opportunity to do doggy things that dogs like to do it's so important and it can be more tricky if your dog is fearful and anxious to find ways in which they can do that and still feel safe so especially for some of the herding breeds like the border collies they may especially need to have lots of things to do otherwise they might be even more anxious. So it's good to think about the different activities that you can do with your dog and find something to do. And that's especially helpful if you're one of those people who started, you wanted to be able to take your dog to the pub with you for dinner. You wanted to be able to take them for long walks in busy places like on the beach or something. And then you can't do it because your dog is afraid. And that's really quite a hard thing to come to terms with. Thinking about the things that you can do and finding ways to turn that into a positive, that there are so many things you can do with your dog and you can find something that works for both of you. I think that's really important. Yes. And it, you know, it enriches your life and, of course, your dogs. And it's like days out and you can build your progress with an agility course or even going to, you know, a village hall and learning some doggy dancing routines, for example, is something I, I love doing and implement that quite regularly in, in the park with, with my own dog, Prudence. We have our little funny routines, but she loves them and it's a great way of keeping her focus and, and it's about teamwork and and that really, you know, it helps the human as well as the dog. That's that's the wonderful thing about it. Would you agree? Absolutely. It helps the human because we get dogs because we want to have a good friend and be able to hang out and do things with them. So it really helps the human as well as the dog. And I think it's important to remember the I mean, the human an animal bond is so important and it's such a big, important part of this. So it's not just about helping the dog. It is also about helping their person, too. 
Yes. Oh, Zazzy, amazing. And and it is difficult if, you know, you bring a puppy in and they're, 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 you know, you're not sure how to help them. But there is lots of help at hand. And, and it's just in, important, really, to ensure that you're going to be working with a positive trainer, um, maybe even someone who's had experience, particularly with your type of dog you know um as all dogs are so individual and there are very strong breed traits like border collies for example they love herding so how to channel herding behavior into something positive um so that they don't become destructive and and then cause you more problems as you know they've eaten your your table or something you know there's all sorts of <laughs> quite extraordinary stories of what dogs can eat. I mean, a friend of mine's dog did manage to eat a whole hole through a door to escape. That was the oh, level dear. of their fear. Yeah, I know. Which, you know, that's, that's massive, you know, massive. So it's important that these things don't happen. <laughs> Yes, it is. And I would say anytime you're struggling, reach out for help, make sure that you get a good trainer who will only use these kind humane methods, who has experience of working with the kind of issue that you've got. And also reach out to your veterinarian as well and just get a check in case there's a medical issue or see if maybe they want to prescribe some psychoactive medications because these days there's an increasing awareness of using those with dogs too and you're not on your own there are lots and lots of people who are struggling with their dog and there is a lot that you can do to help even if you can't completely fix the issue there's a huge lot you can do to make a big big difference Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, the journey is long and it's about, you know, a lifetime together, uh, like a relationship, really. You know, let's face it, you know, in, in the human sphere, relationships need working at and sometimes things are good and then something sometimes things aren't. And it's just about seeing the good and pushing that forwards as best you can. Yes, that sounded I mean, a bit philosophical, actually. <laughs> I, I don't know, <laughs> but you get my drift. Yes, it's true. It's just something that you might have to keep on working at. And I've got a story in the book about my dog, Bodger, and how we spent a whole summer working on a specific noise issue because he was afraid he of loud noises and there was one summer because we get lots of black bears in the neighborhood my neighbors kept setting off what we call bear bangers which make a loud noise to scare the bears away um and that's the right thing for them to do because if the bears get habituated to people then that's very very bad for them and they end up dead unfortunately so I couldn't complain about the loud noises at all but Bodger hated them and you can read in that story how it really took time over the, it took the whole summer over time to make a difference. And to begin with, if he heard one of these loud noises, we just had to run home to where he felt safe. And then very gradually we started to see a change. And every single time one of these loud noises happened, I would give him a really nice treat. He liked tripe stick. So I had to carry tripe stick in my pockets, which stank, <laughs> but it was necessary. <laughs> I love um, a tripe stick. Well, not me personally, but they're, they're wonderful. I think they're wonderful. Yes, I think most dogs seem to think they're absolutely amazing. So that's why that's what I picked. Bodger absolutely loved them. Um, and I just had to put up with the smell. But to begin with, he would be too afraid to take it. But I would make sure he knew that I had it and we would run home and then I would get get him to have it when we got home and he would eat it when he calmed down enough to feel safe. And then eventually he started being able to take it while we were still out before we ran home. And then after a while, he could eat it and we'd walk home a bit more slowly and we didn't have to run. So really slow progress. But it's important to know that slow progress is progress. And it's, as you said, it's something you just have to keep on working at. And over time, you can make a difference. Yes. And a really good point that you made there for people to think on is if a dog doesn't take a treat from you, if they normally do love this piece of treat, then it is a sign that they are overwhelmed, not feeling comfortable, too scared to kind of relax to eat. And that's then your big clue, really, that you can't really go any further today. And like you said, you have to go home. Yes, that's really important because quite often people will say, but my dog doesn't take treats, so how can I use treats to work with them? And that is a clue that the dog is too scared. So instead, you're thinking about what can I do to make this situation less stressful for them so that they do feel comfortable in order to take treats. And I think that's 
sometimes a bit difficult for people to work out and and it, it can take some thinking about what can you do you know to get further away from something or to make something seem quieter or just not to put your dog in that situation at all and to to think of ways in which you can break it down and make like a mini version of that situation where they would still feel comfortable. And there's a technique to that. So that's why, again, it's a good idea to work with a dog trainer who's used to this and who's used to thinking about these things and can break something down into lots of little, small, tiny, tiny steps that will work for your dog. Yes, that's right. It's all about incremental and taking it really, really slowly. And that really is the key. And I think in this day and age, we're so so in a rush, aren't we, the whole time? You know, we're always thinking... Right, what I've got to do next, you know, it's well, it's a massive human failing, I think. You know, we find it very difficult to be just in the moment. Um, and that's something, of course, dogs can teach us to do. And in and indeed, working through issues like this, it helps, it really helps us, you know, to think it's okay, you know, I'm going to stand here for five to ten minutes. That's fine. I don't have to look at my phone. You, are you are you with me? It's like uh, it's it's a whole process which I think we've just covered. But it's important to think of it like that. I think our lives, our human lives, can sometimes be at odds with our dogs. Yes, and I think we can get quite philosophical about this again, but it's good for us to slow down and to see things at a more natural level and not always be like fast paced, like the speed of social media or computers or whatever or anything like that. But just to slow down, to be in the moment with our dogs and to be aware of things that are happening around us and paying attention to what's happening in the environment and thinking about it from our dog's perspective. I think that's really good for us. It's good for us to slow down and it's good for us to have these nice relationships with our dogs too. Oh, it so is. A life without a dog is no life at all, Sassy. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. Some poor people would love a dog and they can't get one. And I think in those cases, when they understand that their life does not fit for the dog, um, I think that, you know, that's a good realization and we have to thank them for recognizing that. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I love my dog, Pepper. He's just wonderful and he's such a comfort to me and he's such good company. And yeah, he's I wouldn't be without him. He's wonderful. And he's been work in progress for you. And you're very honest about that in the book, which, you know, I loved, you know, about when he first arrived as a rescue, as many rescues are, you know, they're a bit shut down, maybe a bit confused, a bit thinking, what the dickens am I doing in this home? You know, who's that? Who goes there? Or weird sound outside or, you know, and that's something as well is to let dogs have time to breathe, to think, to accept things as well and and that's your role to guide them really it's our duty of care fundamentally it is whenever a new dog comes to our home it's a big big transition for them and even though we know that we're there for a forever home they don't and they have to learn that over time so Pepper is my shih tzu he's 13 and a half now but he came to us when he was 10 and he, he came from a local shelter and he was so quiet when he first came to live with us and he didn't bark. And I kept thinking, well, I'm more used to big dogs than little dogs, but I'm sure little dogs are meant to bark quite a lot. But he didn't. And then what happened one day was there was actually a news item about the shelter that he'd come from. And they were talking to members of staff there. So we recognized their voices he recognized their voices and all of a sudden he was barking at the telly and it felt like he he heard them and he was saying I'm here I'm here um, that's what it felt like to us in, in any case but it was like that was the thing that started him barking and until that point he was so quiet and I think he was just still settling in and not comfortable enough to feel that he could bark yet and now of course he does bark and he's he's meant to bark when someone comes to the door for example that's very useful so that's good but it was just a reminder that it, even for a dog who is a very good dog and really quite a comfortable dog not too many anxieties he still took time to settle in and I think that's important for everyone to know it you just have to give your new dog a, a bit of a peaceful time and recognize that it will take weeks or in some cases months for them to really settle in properly. Absolutely and it's also okay isn't it Sassy for dogs to be a bit naughty? 
<laughs> oh, I love it when they're a bit naughty. And yet there's a section on that in the book because it's important to know that they're not robots. We don't get them because we don't want robots, you know. So we just have to recognize that sometimes they will be a bit naughty. And that is in part what we love about them. It can be absolutely adorable. So long as it's not a sign of them being uh, distressed, of course, if it's not a sign of them being fearful and anxious, then it is adorable. We have to let them get away with being a bit naughty sometimes. Absolutely. And, you know, so they don't harm themselves or, you know, coming up to Christmas, think, oh, great, let's jump on the, the kitchen counter and eat all these mince pies and then end up at the vets having an anti, you know, a sickness injection. Um, we don't want that. So it is about... Um, being careful and not to put your dog in a situation where they may be able to jump on the counter and eat 12 mince pies, for example, which does happen, doesn't it, Zazie, over Christmas, you know, and Christmas is a stressful time and that's coming up. So all I can say is please buy this book, everyone who's listening. Um, and in fact, you know, Zazie's other two books are extremely good as well. So why not buy the whole set, particularly if you have a cat as well? And I know lots of listeners do, as cats need a lot of understanding as well, which is something that's relatively new to me, well, 14 years, but that's a lot shorter time frame than, you know, I've had dogs around. So yeah, Zazie, you are brilliant. And thank you again for sparing the time this evening to join us on A Dog's Life. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. That's our show, Mr. Binks. What did you think? It's really good. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, why don't you rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcast? It really makes a difference. Thanks again, of course, to Zazie for joining us today. And all the links are in the show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike Hanson, my producer, for all the music and production as ever. What's that, Mr. Binks? Oh, yes, you're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. So go on, subscribe. It's free. And that way, you'll never miss another show. Bye for now. Bye.